I'm going to start a brand new teaching series. It is called Disciple. And what this means is that we're going to learn how to walk in the ways of Jesus. <laughs> I was like, the Lord just laid this on my heart. I have a few topics I want to hit over the next few weeks. But um, I want you to know that as followers of Jesus Christ, who we are, Jesus literally said to the disciples to go and make more disciples. Well, what does it mean to be a disciple? It means to be a disciplined one. You're disciplined in the ways of Jesus Christ. There's, there's really not an idea of Christianity of having a ticket to heaven or being the, a member of a certain church with a certain name and a sticker on your car, right? It's a little bit more than that. And so the idea of being a disciple is the idea of being wholehearted in your devotion to Jesus Christ. That we don't compartmentalize our Christianity where Christianity is just kind of a, a thing that, that yeah, we, we go to church here and there, and you know, where it's not on the fringe of your life. It's just something out there you think about from time to time. But it's at the center of your day-to-day -day activity. It's at the center point of who you are as a person. And to be a disciple is one of the best labels that you can have in your life. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. The disciplines that Jesus walked in the disciplines that he had in his life are a part of my life. I'm learning how to walk and live my life by looking at how Jesus walked and how he lived his life. Now, does that sound like a good idea? That we're, am I in the right place this morning? Amen. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. All right. You encouraged me, so I'll preach. All right. Let's go. Father, I thank you for your word. There is no one like you. And as we launch this new series, I pray that you would take us to new depths of knowing you, of walking and talking and knowing you, allowing who you are to permeate every part of our being and how we think, how we talk, how we act, what we do. Lord, thank you for your grace. We know we're not perfect, but Lord, our heart is to serve and to know you with all that we have. Everything offered to you. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Are you one of those people that are good or were good at taking tests in school? You one of those people? If you were, anybody in here, you'd say, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't bad at doing that. I was all right. I know you were. Well, God bless your heart. Uh, <laughs> uh, I could say, I got better later in high school and in college for sure, but most of the time in junior high and, high, and earlier on in high school, I'd do two out of seven homework assignments in math. I'd roll in there to the day of the test. And, you know, I, I, I did have it down. I'd pray before the test, Lord bless all this, Lord. And I'd get a D, and I'd get a D. <laughs> And, you know, it's interesting how that, how that works. And I, I realized that as I, as I went through and, and your subjects that you're taking get more appropriated towards what you're actually going to do in life. And I realized that the tests and the trials, or I should say the tests that I was taking <laughs> for math weren't actually the end. It was actually the test was showing okay, you've learned this, and you're approved to go and actually use this stuff in real life. But we all know we don't really use this stuff in real life, right? We always say that about what we're learning in school. But that's the idea. The test is actually the beginning. It's not the end. It's like when you graduate from school, that's, that's the start. <laughs> that's not the end. It's the end of a season. But the test is there to show that you are ready. You are approved. You're ready to go to a new place. I think of when Christy and I, we were blessed to be able to go and train for ministry together. Um, we went to Phoenix First Pastors College. Um, it was a, a, an Assemblies of God uh, ministry school. We had a great time going there. It was, uh, I really did, from 2000 to 2002. Uh, September 11th happened while we were in school. It was just a great time. Challenging. Uh, at, at times there. Uh, every day I had to dress up in, in a tie and, and, and wear all the full thing, and she had to wear a dress every day. It was like, we were 
business. We weren't going there for purpose. And I remember this one class that we had was called hermeneutics. And hermeneutics is the big theological term for uh, biblical interpretation and application. So you learn how to read the Bible, interpret the Bible, and apply the Bible to your life. By that time, I was learning how to take tests, and they, our, our, our professor, Dr. Rahman, he came in at the, right as we were ready to prep for the test after he'd been teaching, you know, doing all that at the end of the semester. He said, okay, so here's how this is going to go. He said, and he was tough. It was the toughest class. The, the students knew this class as the beast, hermeneutics. And so he said, I hope you've taken good notes because there's going to be 10 essay questions. I'm not going to tell you what they're going to be. It's going to be from what I just taught you over the last however long I've been teaching you, how many weeks it's been. <laughs> People be freaking out. And so you had to get your, your notes and note cards. I remember I staying up literally all night with flashcards. Anybody been there before? You're like, in college, there's just all night. You just do all night stuff, so you're ready the next day. We didn't know sleep till after we graduated, really. Uh, and, and we were just boom, 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 going in. And by God's grace, somehow, we were able to get good grades and graduate and be able to get through that. You know, here's the thing. That test was to say, okay, you got some things down now. You're approved to go out. You've got some concepts you've learned. Now go use it. Now you're ready to go do it. Sometimes we just think, well, the test is just, the, that's the end of the thing. And, you know, your trial in your life is your training. The test you're going through in life is training for what's to come. Some of us think, well, you know, I just got to get through this. I just, I just, I hate this that I'm going through right now. And I understand there's pain sometimes when we're going through trials and tribulations. But if we looked at these things a little bit differently, though, if we looked at them as training, if we looked at the tests, the trials, the things that we go through in life that are really hard to go through, as God preparing us and using these things to do something in our lives and even possibly do something through us in somebody else's life in the future. That through the tests and trials that we go through in life, God's shaping us into being more like Christ. And some of you already have all these questions. Well, did God do this? And did we do what happened? And how long is it going to... And all those kinds of things. We always, we always wonder with the test and the trial that we're going through, we have all these questions. But what I want you to do is to start looking at the tests and the trials and even the tribulations. Tribulations means trouble. Some of the trouble that you go through in life, that God is using it as training to do something that you can't get any other way in this life other than going through that trial or that tribulation. The training is essential if we want to win in life. And God wants you to win in life. God does not want his children defeated. He does not want his children, you know, uh, beggars. It even says in Psalms that, God's seed will not be begging bread. God wants you victorious. Paul said, man, I've had a lot of trials, but God has delivered me out of every one of them. That's what he says. And that's the same thing that God is going to do for you. He's going to deliver you from every trial, tribulation, and test that you go through. But some of you have been rolling in to your test doing two out of seven homework assignments and saying, God bless me, and getting a D on the test. And then saying, you know what, I, I guess I need to redo this test. I don't know, these days they let, they let people in school redo tests a lot. That didn't happen when I was in school. That, didn't, that was not a thing. Some of us are struggling with immaturity we're struggling, we're still, and Paul said it this way, he said, some of you should be on whole foods and meat, but you're still on a baby bottle. And here's why. Some of you have been running from the tests. Some of you have not been allowing God to teach you, to train you. 
remember your trial is training. Say it with me. Say, my trial is training. God's doing something in you. I was talking to Sam one day. We were talking about working out. And I, this etched in my mind. What I know about exercise and working out, I learned from my two sons, really, because they had an awesome strength program. And he just goes, you know, if you're going in and work out and you're, there's not a struggle, he goes, there's really no value in it. There's got to be a struggle. <laughs> Same thing with your test or your trial in life. There's got to be. If you want to develop strength, if you want to be trained for what's to come, if you want to be used by God, if you want to have the kind of marriage God wants you to have, if you want to raise these kids to know Jesus, there's going to be struggle. But your test is training. Now, you can have struggle out there in the world with no value. There's no value in it. <laughs> Why? There's no purpose for it. So what about you? Well, no. See, God redeems our tribulation, our tests, our troubles. We put them in his hands, and he uses them for his glory. There's purpose to it. He uses them to form and fashion and do things inside of you that cannot be done any other way in this world. That's what God does. God wants you to win in this life, not lose. I want to give you some theological fallacies concerning uh, your trial is training and the tests that you go. Theological fallacies about tests and trials. The number one thing you've got to understand is that God is not using the test or trial you're in right now to trick you into sin and say, see, you're no good. That's a lot of times what we think about God is that he's trying to trick us into some, some failure so he can make some point and say, see, there you go. That's who you, I mean, uh, some of us accuse God of things of doing things with us in our lives that we would never do to our own kids. And then we, a lot of times, we'll charge God. We'll say, like, God, how could you do that? And, and he's not doing it. So he doesn't trick you into sin. Sometimes, though, he does lead us into a place where we're going to go through testing. It says this in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, and I want to show you this verse. Then Jesus, right before he started his ministry, this was, just, this, was tri this was a trial that was training. A trial that was training. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, who did the tempting? Literally says it right there. <laughs> well, God did this. No, he didn't. But God does lead us into places. You say, oh, how could God do that? How could he lead us? Well, I don't know. I done it with my kids since the time they were born. Every time I enlisted them into some sort of sport, actually just bringing them into this world, I knew they were going to have to go through trials in this world, tests. If you don't want to have your kids go through that, then don't have kids <laughs> because they're going to go through it. Or if you enlist them to play a sport, you know that's a little microcosm where they're going to be test, trained, stretched, they're going to they're gonna have to grow. They're going to have to learn some things to go to that place that you want to see them develop to in their lives. Yes, the Spirit leads us into places where we'll go through training. And Jesus is here with 40 days, and then through that time, and we'll get to some other passages of Scripture here, he battled the enemy. Okay? One thing that I can say unequivocally is that God's not telling you just sit down and, and just, just suffer. There's nothing you can do. Not true. Now there is, I believe, a shelf life on every temptation. God does oversee it. He is in control. We do have a part to play. And that's why some of, you, some of us, we just keep going through the same, same thing. When we see that, I, I would, I would ha start to pray, God, what do you want me to, what do I need to learn? What do you want me to learn? What, what are you trying to deposit in me that I'm, I'm not receiving right now? I want to know what that is. So he leads us. Number two fallacy, theologically, 
theological, say that uh, like five times really fast, theological fallacies about tests and trials. God isn't trying to point out how weak you are. Oh, you're just a little girly man, right? Like Hans and Franz would say. He's trying to show you, see, you're weak, you're unprepared. If he would show you weakness in the midst of your test or your trial, it's so that he can strengthen it. It's not to point it out so that you beat yourself up and you go into self-loathing and you go over in the fetal position and suck your thumb. That's not training. That's feeling bad for yourself. Feeling bad for yourself is not a part of the training that God's trying to give you about your trial and your test. No, no, no. Feeling bad for ourselves or uh, adapting a, a victim mentality into your mindset and it's just, it's always bad for me. It never goes right for me. And actually, that's rolling into the class, doing two out of seven homework assignments and getting a D. Until you step up and say, God, I want to learn what you need me to learn right now. I want to allow you to redeem this situation in my life, this trial. I'm going to see you bring me through it victoriously. And by the way, I want to say that again. God wants you to win in this life. He does not want you to lose. Amen? He never wants, which one of you, you want your kids to lose and be defeated and live a defeated life? They might have to go through losses at times, but you will show them how to lead them through that time victoriously. And see, so in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, God says to Paul as he prays about this test and trial that he was going through in his life, he says, well, I want to tell you something, Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. So there was a weakness that was exposed, and then what God says is, now I want you to depend on me even more and know that my unearned blessings and favor, who I am at the core, me, is more than enough to help you through what you're going through. My grace is sufficient for you. Always remember, God is good and the devil is bad. Who brought this sickness into my life? The devil. He's come to kill, steal, and destroy. It's the John, it's the 1010 principle. Jesus said, I've come to give life, but the enemy has come to kill, steal, and destroy. That's simple math. If it's good, it's God. If it's bad, it's the devil. That's it. He's the originator of all that's, that brings death. But God is good. That's why we say that all the time. It's because that's one of the things, you know this. It's one of the things that the enemy's going to come to you and say, is God's doing this. It's because you didn't do, you, did, you should have went to church, you should have done this thing, you should have prayed more. You haven't been praying. You haven't been doing, and he'll, he'll try to shame you into a place where you're just like, you know what, maybe, you're, maybe this Christianity thing, I can't do this. I can't keep up and make God happy with me. He's never going to be happy with me. All this stuff happens. When I, and we start attributing the works of the enemy to God. And so a fallacy here is that God's not trying to point out how weak you are. What he might do, though, is expose some weaknesses and then cover over those weaknesses by his strength and grace. And that's going to cause you to be stronger than you were before. Can I get an amen? Somebody, amen. Amen. Number, number three fallacy is God isn't trying to beat you up in order to instruct you. Some of you have already felt like this. You're like, God's not a father. He's a drill instructor. He's a boot camp guy. He's like kicking my butt all the time. That's all he's doing is just kicking my butt. If you feel like that, I would again stop and I'd say, God, what am I not learning? I'm stuck in this same lesson. <laughs> You're trying to train me. I'm, there's something that I'm not getting. So, Lord, show me, because I know that's not where you want me to be. And so, he, he's not trying to be, God doesn't beat up his kids. Some of us attribute God to things that we would never attribute to a parent. If, some, if we would say God would do these things to us, and if we would say, well, a parent's doing this to their kid, Juan, who works for the police department for Phoenix, would come arrest you. <laughs> Because that's not our God. That's not our Father. 
That's not who he is. That's not what he does. You've got to know the true nature of God and who he is. Remember, your trial is training. Somebody say it with me one more time. Ready? Your trial is training. It's training. It's making you stronger. It's making you more aware. It's making you of more value to the kingdom. By the way, the only thing you can take to heaven with you is So when I say God's using this test and trial in your life to do something through you to make to impact somebody else, that's the only thing of eternal value that we have. Sure, he wants you to bless be blessed in other places in life, but another car is not going to do for you what you think it's going to do. God's trying to do things in us that have not only value here in this world, but that last beyond and go to those next places. Discipl uh, disciples are disciplined ones. That's what we are. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. You're a disciple of Jesus Christ. It means you're a person of discipline. There isn't one sin in your life that should have its claws so deep into your life that it tells you what to do. And I know. Now, that might not be a true story right now. Some of you might be looking at it and saying, you know, that's just not true for me. And I, I understand that. I've been there. I've been there. I know you hate it, though. Because I know the Holy Spirit's in you and you hate it. And so what we have to do is realize that God, that test, that trial, that perhaps habit, character flaw, you losing your temper, you know, you having a certain addiction in your life. You know, lust is a huge thing. And trying to get control over your eyes and what you're taking in. In our society and day and age, it's a, it's a, it's a plague of the age. It's an idol of the age. You know the scripture says to you that sin will not be your master? That any particular sin, character, flaw, habit, addiction, stronghold that you might have in your life, something that is compelling you to do something, something impulsatory, that's just an impulse and it's hard to get a master over. It said that, you know, Christ died to set you free from sin and you are set free from sin, even the thing that right now it looks like you're bound to. You're set free, you just don't know it yet. <laughs> You haven't seen it manifest in your life. But as a disciple of Jesus Christ, a disciplined one, God uses these trials and tests and sometimes even our perceived failures to do a work in us and teach us how to overcome those struggles, those sins, those addictions, those character flaws, and do something of great value in us so that when you see somebody else or maybe your own children stuck in something, you can reach down and say, let me show you how this works in Jesus Christ. Amen? That's how it works. And so, uh, some of you know this if you've been in the valley for a while. There's an an old General Motors proving ground, a training facility. I want to say it's, it was off Ellsworth Road. I think it's from Ellsworth to Ironwood, uh, and it's the, going from like the 60 all the way down to Queen Creek. Uh, it's not there anymore. I think there's houses there now. <laughs> uh, but this training facility was used by these automakers. They'd send their newest models out there. They were designed a certain way, and they'd go into this testing facility, and this testing facility would, would reveal strengths, dynamic strengths of the vehicle, uh, how they should market the vehicle. You know, if it, was a, it had a good suspension system and, and it took turns well, then it would, it would market it that way. It wasn't so much that it did reveal, obviously, too, it's, there were weaknesses. There were things that were exposed and things that needed to be worked on, all at this testing facility, this training facility. Some of us say, I just want my Christianity to be all about small groups and Starbucks and Bibles and just fluffy white clouds on a 77-degree day in Arizona. I'm just going to enjoy all that. That's the way it's going to be. And I could get up here and preach that kind of message every week. Number one, that's just not who I am.
But I do believe that God is, you know, we believe that God is good. But that's not the idea. The idea is biblical truth. And that will set you free. And that'll bring a depth to our church family and a depth to you personally that nothing else can bring. God has a testing facility. The, tri- the trials of life, the tribulations, the trouble you go through. Yes, he uses, he takes what the enemy meant for evil and makes it work for your good. What, how? It blow, that has always blown my mind. How does God take something that was intended for evil and make it work for my good somehow? That's one of the best things that God could ever do for us. It's to take all the evil, all the bad, and somehow make, he doesn't do that for the world. He does it for his children, for you. He does it for you. I don't know how that all works. It doesn't mean there's not pain. It doesn't mean there's not tears. It doesn't mean that there's not a struggle. Because there still is. What I have found that tests and trials in my life have always strengthened me, have always led to the furthering and the fulfilling of God's destiny for me in my life. We talked a little about that, Ephesians 2.10. That God has good works ordained for you, that you should walk in these. And so the tests and trials of my life have always strengthened me and helped me focus on how I can walk towards the destiny. You say, what's destiny? That's a weird, big word. That's where we get our word destination. There's a destination for you that God's already preordained, and he wants you to arrive there at your life's end. Some people say, well, uh, God's going to hold you accountable for all the people you didn't reach. And uh, stop. There's, there are something that's called the judgment seat of Christ. We can talk about that a different day. We can talk about some of those things. Yeah, there is. God wants you. But he's not going to play a movie one day and say, this is where you, will, you missed it. You missed it and all this. But here's what I know about this. I'm going to give you the synopsis. Every time in the book of Revelation or anywhere you see a picture of heaven drawn, It'll say these, guys, these, these saints have crowns on their head. They've got jewels. And we get those jewels, whatever that looks like, by the things we do in this world that have eternal implications. And so it's not to make this guy blow up on social media and he just goes viral because look at his crown. No, he doesn't get glory. But what I see is those that have more the jewels and the things, they were committed and they, they wanted to fulfill God's destiny for their lives. They were able to take all of that, and here's what I see consistently. They throw it at the feet of Jesus in worship. So some of us are going to be able to extravagantly worship the Lord in a different way. Because when you're there, nothing else is going to matter, I promise you. Other than Jesus, nothing else will matter. You know, you're not even, you know, your mansion, yeah, that's fine, but trust me, God, whoa, God is here. <laughs> you see him. <laughs> He's there, and, and to be able to express your worship towards him is going to be the cry of our heart. And so us being able to take off our crowns and those jewels and the things that we are able to do in this life and cast them at the feet of the Lord and worship, that is worth fighting for in this life. That is worth going through the trial that is training in this life. Here's your trial is training toolkit as I finish. You ready for this? Here it is. The number one thing you need to put in your toolkit is patience. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Don't be anxious about anything. Come again. Let me introduce you to my anxiety. <laughs> Some of us have named him Harry. My anxiety, Harry. He's there here. He's my friend. I keep him around. He follows me around. Anxiety is not a part of your personality. And if it is, it shouldn't be. You say, why? Because what happens... Anxiety pushes you away from the place you should be. It causes you to become frenetic and and you are uh, responsive. You're triggered. 
we're, we're, we're not thinking clearly. We're not centered. And so do not be anxious about anything. Now, I'm a, I'm a big believer in all the things, you know, some of us, you have too much caffeine. That's why you worry. <laughs> it's just, you know, uh, or there could be even other things at times. There's, there's, there's chemical things or whatever. Sure, do what you need to do. But part of it is a choice. Don't discount. We need to stop looking to all the world solutions for things that God says, here is the answer for you, my child. To not choose anxiety, but to learn and grow and be disciplined in your thought life. To keep the promises at the forefront of your mind and choose not to be anxious about anything in your life. What would that look like to not be anxious about anything? But in every situation, I can tell you what that would look like. If we weren't anxious about anything, peace would reign, and we would have patience. We would learn to stay the course. We wouldn't change and try to do all these other things and go into debt, and I'm not sure how it's going to happen, and, and well, let's try this thing. I've seen Old Testament saints that times they, they went out and they went to tarot cards or they went to a, some, some spiritualist over here to try to find an answer, and it was evil and not of God, and they went to, why? Because they were anxious about it. They weren't patient patience, all these things work together, the next couple things I'm going to show you, but in every situation, you take prayer and petition. Patience is not passivity. Let me say that again. You're not being passive by being patient. You're, you're actually humbling yourself under God's hand and trusting his timing. And you're saying, God, I know you see. I know you're aware. You're not aloof and distant. And you're going to take care of this in my life. And then it actually says, not only should we not be anxious, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, you ask God about the situation you're going through. That you take time to be thankful to God. Let me just give you that encouragement. If the only time that we spend time to be thankful to God is maybe when we're at church, I think that that's we need to develop a little bit of depth to our thanksgiving. Let's take it to a new level, a new place. Let's, let's choose to be even more thankful than that. Number two, the second toolkit, the second tool in our kit, I should say, is peace. I want to give you a verse on this, Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 25. Some of you, this one I think is going to strike you right where, right here. Um. Have no fear of sudden disaster or of the ruin that overtakes. Oh my God, what am I going to do? You, <laughs> you know what I'm thinking. <laughs> She's next to me driving. You see those taillights up there? <laughs> Everybody's breaking. <laughs> You're not breaking. <laughs> I can see her sometimes. She grabs the handle up here. <laughs> the oh crap handle, they say. She grabs that. <laughs> and I know she... No, it's, we joke about it. But honestly, if your first reaction to what you can't see, to what you hear, to what um, some report is to you, is, oh my God, what am I going to do? This is exactly what this verse says. It says, no, 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 uh, uh, be steadfast. Keep your peace. If there's a guard in your heart, that stands guard, it's peace. And as soon as we lose our peace, we start to fall back in the, in the test and the trial that we're going through. And so when you're being trained by your trial, keep your peace. And some of us, you have, let me just say, you have peace. It's inside you now if you are a believer. It might not be developed. And anxiety and some other things and panic might be our impulsive response. But I want to I ask you, contend against that. Fight that. And that takes us to number three. The number three toolkit. One more after that and we're done. Uh, is The number three is scripture. In your toolkit, if there's not... A, a, a relationship and a deep relationship 
with Scripture. In Matthew chapter 4, this is how Jesus dealt with his trial. In verse 3, the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. So the enemy came in and kept putting these temptations, these trials, this junk on Jesus. He didn't just stand there and just say, I just got to suffer for God. I just got to suffer for God. By the way, you don't have to choose to suffer. You do have to make a choice to believe. Hello, somebody. Did you hear what I just said? Because some of you, if you put that in your theological pipe and you smoked it for a while, it would change some things in your life. That was from the same professor that did the essay question test said that all the time. <laughs> you just think about it. Like, like God didn't say, hey, just sit there and suffer. You can't do anything about this. God is completely sovereign. There's nothing you can do. No, we have weapons of our warfare and we can fight in the training and the trial. I think sometimes where people, you can't make the test and the trial stop always when you want it to stop. Because Jesus went out for what? Here, if some of you that know the verse, the passage of scripture, right before he went out, he went out into the wilderness for how many days? 38. He was speaking the word. Why couldn't he cut that off and make it be 20? Why couldn't he stop that? Why couldn't Job have done that? It was 42 chapters, not 36, not 29. But see, these men and Jesus, our forerunner, showed us that if you stay the course, you pick up the weapons of your warfare, you fight. You've got to resist the enemy. You submit to God, but then what a lot of Christians do, and there's a lot of theology about this, is they don't resist the enemy. They just sit back on their hands and say, well, I guess it's just God's will. He just wants me to go through this. There's nothing I can do. That's not true. You are called to fight the good fight of faith. Jesus, you say, how do I do that? Well, the sword of the Spirit is, come on, the sword of the Spirit is, it's the Word. And the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, is that faith is voice activated. I say it a lot. Think of Siri on your phone. Hey, Siri. Someone's phone just woke up. That's what faith is. Faith is voice activated. It's why Jesus, the enemy came with three different temptations in three different ways. They tried it at different angles. Every time, rather than just succumbing to the temptation, Jesus responded, it is written. What did he do? He took out a sword and he said, no, 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 no. We ain't going to do this. I'm going to fight you. I'm going to fight you. Sort of has a, uh, excuse me, the scripture has a defensive side and an offensive side. We can talk about that more a different day, but get involved with that. The last one is this, is humility. Humility. God has a perfect plan. I don't understand it all. I don't know it all. I don't know exactly when this trial is going to end, but even if it was, and this is where we got to be, even if it was the rest of my life, I'm in, God, I'm not out. Job didn't have anywhere. Job in the Bible, the first book of the Bible. There was, if you read the book of Job, it's the first book that I studied. I thought it was actually Job. I didn't know it was Job. But there was no Bible. In chronological order, it's the first book of the Bible that was written. It, historically, when it took place. There was, there was no Bible. I don't even know if Job know, knew there was a devil. He just saw, saw these things happen, and he figured God did it. He didn't have near what we have at our disposal, the weapons of warfare we have. And yet he said, it's one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. He said, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Come again. Some of us, if our door dash is five minutes late, or if it's too hot, too cold, or not the right temperature at church, or you know things aren't exactly right, if I'm not served exactly, that parking or whatever, is I gotta walk a little bit away. Though he's, 
he was saying, even if God somehow was trying to take me out, I mean, here, simple math is, <laughs> simple math is, he is God. <laughs> so for him, he was like, I'm in either way. I'm still going to give him my, but then he said, yet I know my redeemer lives, Job said. I know he's going to redeem me. And he certainly did. Chapter 42, gave him back twice all that he had before. That's the goodness of our God. Um, the verse I want to give you here is Proverbs chapter 3 and verse, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on all your concepts, all the things of the world. Uh, I don't understand it all. I, that's okay. Verse 6. In all your ways, you humble yourself. To submit means to arrange under. I arrange myself under God's hand. I don't understand, but I trust you. I know this trial is training. I believe that Jesus has come to give me abundant life. He is going to lead me to victory. I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And he will show you the path. Humble yourself under his hand. I, I personally believe Christians are warriors. And I believe the world right now has lost heart. And I love how the scripture tells us to take courage or take heart. If you're going through a trial or a tribulation or a test, you have to take courage. Take heart. You might not feel really good about where you are and what's going on. But what God encourages you to do is to take it. And when we take courage and we show them who we're trusting and whose plan we're trusting, we humble ourselves under God's hand. In due time, he will lift you up. You'll be above that circumstance and not below it. Can I get an amen, somebody? Come on, praise him. Our God is good. Come back for part two next week. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to hear your word today, to be together freely, to worship in church. So much good that you've done for us. I pray for every person in this room that might be going. We're not making light of these trials and these tribulations and the tests that we might be going through. But God, help us to look at our trial as training that you're doing something of value within us. That God, you are making a way where there isn't a way. You're shaping us. You're doing something of perfect value on the inside of us. God, we need you and we thank you. If with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to ask you, do you know Jesus? Have you put your faith and trust in him? Or maybe you're ready to come home and recommit your life to God. Maybe you've wandered away. Today's the day, now's the time. Commit your life to God. He'll change it all. He'll bring you into a life with him, man, that is better than you ever imagined it could be. So I want to ask the entire congregation to pray after me and say, dear God, I come before you today, a sinner. I ask you to come into my heart, be my Lord, and be my Savior. I believe you are the Son of God, and I give you my life now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I believe someone came to the Lord today. Praise the Lord. God is good. And if you did that, the best thing you can do is, number one, you got to tell somebody else. Be back here next week. Go on to our website. Sign up for baptism. That's the Bible way to show the world that you are married to Christ, that you've given your life over to Jesus. I want to share this verse. Uh, James, real quick, Joe. James chapter 1. I forgot to give this. The Lord quickened me. James 1, verses 2 and 4. 2 through 4. So James 1, 2. Let's just start there super quick. Consider it pure joy, my brothers sisters whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance and let perseverance finish its work its training so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything 
That's what your trial will do in you when we partner with God. Amen? Amen. God is good. Thank you, family. I will see you next week. He's got an awesome word for you then. God bless.